I'm Harold Paddock. I know several of you from my work in the Common Police Court or through the uh, Civil War Committee that we had. I'm here to chat about the Common Police Court General Division. In law, you learn that words have meaning and words have to be used with specificity. So let's talk a little bit about the court. What is it and what does it do? We tend to think of a court as a building. I'm going to court. You say that like, I'm going to the theater, or I'm going to the hospital. But a court is really an institution. It's a civic entity that performs a specific civic function. So we're going to get into some more detail about that, but at least you know that the court is located in this handsome building that you've hopefully all seen on East Main Street. The technical name for the Common Police Court is the General Division. We heard a little bit about that in some of the introductions that some people's work here today is uh, specific to the general division. What does general mean when you're talking about the jurisdiction of a court? Sometimes uh, words are best used through process of elimination, where you kind of carve out what things are. You can say that a duck is a bird that doesn't honk, doesn't hoot, it's a duck. Well, what does a duck do? Well, it quacks. So by knowing what something doesn't do, you learn more about what it does do. Does the County Police Court General Division handle divorces, dissolutions, child support issues? No. That's our neighbors across the street in the Domestic Relations Division, sometimes just called the Domestic Court. Do we handle probate matters? That's the building on the other side of the wall, or the unit of the building on the other side of the wall. Certainly very important with estates, guardianships, wills, trusts. No, we don't handle that. That's a specialized area handled by probate court, just the way orthopedists in a hospital might handle specialized cases. The probate court handles specialized cases. Do we handle abuse, neglect, and dependency? Got that building right across the street? No, that's not the role, that's not the obligation of the general division. And we don't handle OMVI, very certainly an important area, keeping drunk drivers off the street, handling certain criminal cases, misdemeanors, making sure that the smaller cases get justice just the same as the big cases that falls within the jurisdiction of the municipal court. So we've covered a lot of areas where the Common Police Court General Division does not do anything. Is there anything left over? Absolutely. We cover everything else. Anything that does not fall within the jurisdiction of a specialized court goes to the general division of the court. What does that constitute? On the criminal side, that's the bigger cases, the felony cases, all the way from you know, capital murder down to the, the lowest F5. Each one of these categories, we could cover more and more of them. There's a list quite a, quite a bit bigger than the size of the screen as to all the potential criminal cases that could fall within the jurisdiction of the Common Police Court, and you've probably prosecuted many of them. On the civil side, we can do lots of things. We are the general in the sense of jack of all trades court, in the sense that we handle injury cases, contract cases. When we had the foreclosure crisis, we were handling thousands of foreclosure cases. If you're ever injured at work, or have a family member injured at work, you might, you might have a workers' comp case, not a sequence here. You might have a workers' comp case, and by law, if the Bureau of Workers' Comp doesn't do what everyone is, uh, wants them to do, there's a possibility for an appeal and it goes to the county of residence of the injured worker. Major business cases, we've got some high-tech industries in Claremont County, trade secrets, employees with a non-compete jumping to another corporation, there's all kinds of business cases that wind up in our court. Malpractice, we tend to think of that as doctors leaving a scalpel in a patient. Malpractice applies to any professional. You can have architectural malpractice. You can have accounting malpractice. You can even have attorney malpractice. So any professional that goofs up, it's likely that their case is going to come to the Common Police Court General Division. And we have you know, civil protection orders. We do hundreds of those each year, and I like to think of that as preventive law. We try to keep situations from escalating to the point where they become crimes or become more serious matters. Try to keep the peace by making sure that people 
behave themselves in a certain fashion. So everything else, civil and criminal, falls within the jurisdiction of our court. We're the, the uh, Swiss Army knife of courts in the sense that we handle so many different things. The, uh, I tell my friends, accounting to zoning, that falls within our court. Literally anything legal that's not somewhere else goes to us and it could be a zoning appeal, it could be partners needing a, a business accounting to uh, break up the business. The other power of the court is to issue certain writs, and a writ is just a fancy word for court order. The two of the big ones mentioned there are habeas corpus, Latin translation, we must have the body, and mandamus, uses the same root as mandate or mandatory. Let's talk about those for a second or two. Let's say hypothetically that someone was arrested in Claremont County, and they were arrested just because of their religious beliefs. They had not committed any crime, they were not charged with anything, they were arrested just because of their religious beliefs. Habeas corpus would be the action that someone would file in the Common Police Court General Division, or potentially in the federal court downtown, saying, this is illegal, this detention is legally improper, release the person. And a judge, rather than someone in the law enforcement community, would make a decision as to whether or not that detention, that arrest was legally proper. This is one of the fundamental freedoms that we enjoy as Americans. Habeas corpus is actually mentioned in the U.S. Constitution, and the only time it's supposed to be suspended is during a time of war or insurrection. We can talk about what President Lincoln did during the Civil War, but that's a history lecture for another day. This other writ over here of mandamus basically is a court order telling someone to do something. One of your agencies might be doing something that's legally improper. Say the recorder's office isn't filing a certain type of deed. And a party that's agreed, say it's a property owner, says, wait a minute, the recorder isn't doing what they're supposed to do. I've got a legal remedy. Tell the reporter to, recorder to follow the law. So someone would file for a writ of mandamus, and a judge would make a determination. What's legally proper here? What should be done? Does the recorder have an obligation to do this particular legal task? So this is part of our legal system where the independent judiciary makes decisions about whether or not somebody can be held against their will, and whether or not government agencies have to do certain things uh, pursuant to law or pursuant to the Constitution. These are the types of things that go to the Common Pleas Court and gives us a very significant role in making sure that everyone's freedom is protected. Let's dive into history a little bit. Uh, if we have one flaw as Americans, we tend to think in the moment or think that all history uh, started uh, in 1776 or during the Civil War or whatever. The Common Pleas Court goes all the way back over 800 years to a court that was created by King Henry II in England. See the date there? 1178. Long, long time ago. The reason the court was created was there were royal courts for disputes between the nobility, you know, a duke and another duke had an argument over property, or uh, the king and a duke and an earl had some sort of dispute. That would be decided in a royal court because it involved a certain class of people. Church cases went to ecclesiastical courts. What was left over? You know, somebody steals somebody else's cow. Okay? There needed to be a court for the common folks, the hardy English yeomen. You can think of the Common Pleas Court as medieval England's version of the People's Court. It was a court for non-royal, non-church disputes, whether it was property or livestock or fencing or inheritance, whatever it might be, the court was created way back when to handle those kinds of cases. Now take a look at these two dates in the Magna Carta of 1215. In less than 50 years, the Common Pleas Court became so popular, so important, and so much part of the justice system in England that the barons forced King John to include a reference to the Common Pleas Court in the Magna Carta. This fundamental charter of the rights of Englishmen references the Common Pleas Court. Let me read you that particular section. Common Pleas Court shall not follow our court. That's 
the royal week shall not follow the king, but shall be held in some fixed place. The idea that there is a local court, it's a court for the people, was already enshrined in the Magna Carta 801 years ago. That's how important to English law the common police court is. If I were to put another date in here, I would put in 1776. Anybody remember what happens in the Declaration of Independence after those opening paragraphs where Jefferson so elo eloquently talks about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? The rest of the document is basically an indictment of King George III as to the rights that he was taking away from the colonists, and the rights that the king was taking away were the rights as Englishmen. Common Pleas Court is not mentioned in the Declaration of Independence, but many of the procedural safeguards, many of the justice safeguards that were recognized as Englishmen's heritage, the colonists felt that they were being deprived of those rights by the king, and that was sufficient grounds, along with some other things, to justify breaking away from England. So the Common Pleas Court and the rights that were created there were enshrined in the Magna Carta, and those rights became, in effect, the basis for the Declaration of Independence lead to our country today. Big gap here between 1215, 1776, then 1802. The very first constitution that the state of Ohio had references the Common Pleas Court, and the next revision of the Constitution just before the Civil War also references the Common Pleas Court. Our court is hardwired into <coughs> our Constitution as Ohioans. It can't be taken away or modified without a constitutional amendment. It is that important that justice be provided in all 88 counties that the drafters of the Constitution <coughs> thought it important enough to provide those, uh, that language for each of the 88 counties in Ohio. Let's talk about one other thing. What happened, say, between 1215 and 1776? The common law courts, including the Common Pleas Court in England, created the law of property, <coughs> contract, and torts. How many, case, how many documents do you have filed in your office that involve deeds, mortgages, leases, easement, thousands. thousands. English common law as developed by the Common Pleas Court as to property is still being used in our recorder's office today. How many of you ever signed a contract to buy a car or buy a refrigerator or anything like that? Everybody's probably signed contracts as adults. Law of contract is English common law created over the centuries in England through actions and decisions of the Common Pleas Court. You go to Jungle Gyms or Meyer or Walmart and you slip and fall on ice in the uh, produce section, what sort of law applies? Law of negligence. Torts. Exactly. Torts. Tort law developed in England and was part of the common law that has been inherited in our country and carries over into Ohio law. There's been a lot of statute, a lot of case law interpreting it. Certainly we have the American Constitution, but at the bedrock is the Magna Carta and these common law principles about property, torts, and contract that underline our legal system carry over today. So we are the living embodiment of principles of freedom that were created over 800 years ago and put into place in the uh, Common Pleas Court. One other provision of the Magna Carta I think is worth quoting, and let me read it to you. This is the famous, what's called Clause 39. No free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possession, possessions or outlawed or exiled or deprived of his standing in any way, nor will we proceed with force against him or send others to do so except by the lawful judgment of his, equal, of his equals or by the law of the land. That's the predecessor of our due process clause. Both the Ohio Constitution and the United States Constitution have due process language. So local courts administering justice in a locality 
for 800 years have upheld these principles, including due process of law, contract, tort, property, and everything else. So we are the ongoing mechanism that makes sure that everyone's rights as citizens are upheld in our society. Now we know a little bit about the history. Let's talk about the building history. This is a tavern. But more importantly than a tavern, it was the first courthouse in Claremont County. They rented space in this tavern in Williamsburg, set up court there, judge would sit, attorneys would make arguments, admitted to the bar means admitted to the court, not necessarily admitted to the tavern. But the idea that there needed to be a fixed place, because originally Claremont County included Brown County, it was much bigger than it was, the county seat was in Williamsburg, but that's the first courthouse. Obviously there were other things going on, you could probably get a meal there, but justice was going on as an ongoing civic service before Ohio was a state, and that's the place where it started. Eventually, they moved into a building that was custom, that was specifically built as a courthouse. We don't have a picture of that, but in 1827, this building was built in the present location of the courthouse, uh, main, you know, East Main Street Market, and this building served the county for 110 years. Eventually, it just got too old, probably was a fire trap, it was wood, and had to be torn down in 1935. Did you see this building back here? That's where my courtroom is. That's the building where the probation department and the magistrate's office are. It's been renovated, obviously, but uh, continuity. We keep the same space. Court has met in that place since 1827. There's a famous bell that was in the tower, and it was kind of the ESPN, Facebook, CNN of its day. They would ring it for major announcements like the start of the Civil War, major uh, victory in the Civil War, things like that. They would also ring it to let uh, attorneys know that they should come back from the tavern or come back from their law office because a verdict was in. So that bell was the, the sort of the town crier. Uh, when the building was taken down, the bell was preserved, but we don't know where it is right now. It may be with the historical society. If somebody knows, uh, let's try to preserve that because it's a piece of of Claremont County history. So this building outlived its usefulness and was replaced with this building, and notice the cars. This is the late 30s, the building opened in 1936. This WPA project, uh, public works, infrastructure, put people to work during the Great Depression. But that building is this building. You've all seen this in walking down Main Street. The original door that you see right there has been replaced with the ceremonial window. And that's the window that commemorates in stained glass all the townships in Claremont County. Ladies, you know where your offices are? Right in there. That's now the clerk's office on the first floor. And this served as the courthouse for many, many years, eventually with population growth, the county and the court system outgrew this particular building. There were some additions, but this building became part of this complex with the creation of the what's called the new courthouse in 1998. Chief Justice Boyer came down for the dedication. The Chief Justice at the time in 1936 <laughs> came down for the dedication of that building, which was considered state-of-the-art at the time. We've got quotes from the Claremont County Sun as to the dedication ceremonies for both buildings, but uh, at the time of this dedication, the Sun made uh, a great announcement that uh, musical entertainment was provided by the Union Gas and Electric Company Band. Apparently corporations for employee <laughs> morale and recreation had musical groups, they had a band, and the band played when that building was, was dedicated. But you can get all these kind of details, and we have these on our website. But the building exists, the building continues to serve justice, the building continues to be a symbol of uh, justice in our community. What goes on inside? Well, four judges preside. Many of you know many of these judges. Many of you know them quite well. 
left to right, that's Judge Ferris, Judge Haddad, Judge McBride, and Judge Herman. Judge Herman is retiring in about six weeks, and Judge Brock will be, uh, be joining us. These judges do the day in and day out work of the court. Let's talk about that a little bit. I should probably just turn this over to Barb, Alice, and Beth and let them chat. When a case is filed, it is started in our clerk's office, payment of a filing fee, filing of legal documents. The clerk's office is responsible for all the paperwork, and boy is there a ton of it. Each case is assigned to one of our judges, and Ohio has what's called a single assignment system, where one judge handles the case all the way through. So there's continuity, uniformity, the judge doesn't have to take time to get up to speed on a case that he's unfamiliar with, the judge handles it from start to finish, unless perchance he has to disqualify himself because he, you know, his brother-in-law is a, a party in the case, something like that, that creates an ethical problem. But basically the judges work on one case, criminal or civil, all the way through. What does that system look like? On the civil side, it's basically an application of the Ohio Revised Code, Ohio case law. The Supreme Court hands down a ruling saying this is how certain criminal sentences are to be done, or this is how insurance contracts are to be interpreted. Those kind of decisions become the law of the state, and we follow those. The proceedings are all covered by the rules of evidence. What's hearsay? What's admissible? What's not? What evidence can be reliable? What can we trust? If a case does indeed go to a jury in a civil case, it's a jury of eight. That's a difference from the, the criminal system. This is what it looks like. And at the risk of vast oversimplification, let me pass these around. Some of you have leftovers from the, the first, but if you could hand this out to everybody. This is my effort to condense. I'm sorry that the slide doesn't come through uh, on the screen with quite the detail that it does in a printout. But this is a shorthand synopsis of the pathways that might exist as to a civil case in our court. Case is filed with the counter in the clerk's office. The clerk's office sends out notice to everyone in the form of a summons so that people know that they've been sued. If someone fails to respond to the case, it's like a forfeit in sports. The team that doesn't show up loses. So if you ever get sued, make sure you respond to that summons, take that complaint and that summons to your attorney, and get started. If you're sued in your official capacity, it would be the prosecutor's office that would handle that on your behalf. A party can move to dismiss. If you think that the claim does not have a legal basis, if it's not a legally proper theory, a party can move to dismiss. More often than not, a party, a defendant, files an answer. They say, wait a minute, I don't owe anything, or no, I'm not responsible for this, or no, I don't have to do that. By filing that answer, they're setting up their viewpoint on the case, putting everyone on notice, hey, these are going to be my defenses, these are the points on the factual side that I agree on, these are the points that I disagree on. There can be discovery. Anybody ever here been subject to a deposition, ever been deposed, somebody ask you questions outside of court? Yeah. Happens with some frequency, and I've, I've been there on both sides of the table. Lots of different information can be gathered. We try to avoid those Perry Mason moments where there are big surprise, somebody stands up in the back of the courtroom, yes, I did it! No, that's, that's TV drama. That doesn't happen because, in fairness, everybody gets, gets a chance to gather the information so they understand both sides of the case and they're ready to make their presentation. If after gathering some facts, somebody thinks, wait a minute, this case is clear cut, this is a slam dunk, law is clear, facts are clear, I should win, that's called a summary judgment, and the judge decides that summary judgment is appropriate, the case can be resolved short of trial, the case would be dismissed, or part of the case would be dismissed. Eventually, after discovery, after the motions practice, the case can go to trial, several different <coughs> forms of trial, it can be a trial to a judge without a jury, where the judge makes the factual decisions and the legal decisions. It can be a trial to a judge with a jury, where the jury makes the factual decisions and the judge provides instructions of the law. It can be a trial to a magistrate. We have a provision in Ohio law where a magistrate, such as myself, can hear a case 
and make a decision, but it's not a final decision it's subject to review by the court. But the same rules of evidence would apply, same procedure would apply. After a trial, there would be a decision, a decision by a judge or a verdict. If no one appeals, that's it. It's fine. You've got 30 days to do that, and that time runs. Case is over. It's, it's fine. If someone disagrees, they can file post-trial motions, or they can file an appeal, and we go to the Court of Appeals. The unsung hero here is the clerk's office. Every one of these steps involves paperwork, motions, notices, summons, subpoenas. Every form of document goes through the clerk's office, and there'll be a separate presentation that you'll do, I, I don't know when, but you'll do it. I'm not going to try to step on your toes, but the clerk's office is in charge of all the tracking, tracing, storing, archiving, recording. It's a massive job, and they do it absolutely brilliantly. We'll leave it for another day as to how they do it. I'm not even sure that I know how they do it. They just do it very well. So that's how it looks on the civil side. Let's talk about criminal cases. Criminal cases start with an indictment. The grand jury acts as a filter to try to make sure that only parties that have a have probable cause of committing a crime are actually charged and the innocent are protected. That's why grand jury proceedings are secret, because a grand jury can listen to evidence, decide, no, there's no crime here, no, that, that person's not involved, and the case would not go forward because the grand jury would have screened that out and that innocent person would be protected. Once a case starts, there's an indictment, parties arraigned, which is an initial appearance where they make sure that the defendant uh, has counsel, bail is set, uh, they know the charges against them. There, whoop, wrong there are motions that can be filed, you've heard of motions to suppress, try to protect the validity of the system by making sure that improper, illegal, unconstitutional evidence does not come in and taint the process. Party can plead guilty or party can go to trial with a jury of 12. It's 12 in a, in a criminal case rather than 8 in civil, and a different set of procedural rules, the rules of criminal procedure. And those are the ones that apply. What does this look like? A little bit different flow chart, and I try to emphasize indictments are the way that most cases start, even though there can be a bind over from municipal court. Arraignment is that first appearance that gets things started. There can be a motion to practice, there can be exclusion of evidence, there can be uh, charges that are dismissed if they're not legally proper. A lot of cases go to a guilty plea. Not saying that that's wrong, I'm just saying that that's a fact. A lot of people, once they're properly counseled by a defense attorney and the evidence is all looked at, they acknowledge that they've done something wrong and they plead guilty. If there's a chance that they want to go to trial, they can go to court, a jury of 12, <coughs> possible verdicts, guilty or not guilty. You notice there's no arrow here. There's no appeal from a not guilty verdict. It would be double jeopardy to charge someone, to try someone again for the same charges. Unsung hero in this particular scenario, probation department. They're going to give a separate presentation. At this stage, after a guilty plea, they would do what's called a pre-sentence investigation where they would look into the character, background, history of an individual and make recommendations to the judge as to whether or not he or she would be a fit subject for probation, drug treatment, different kinds of approaches other than just locking them up. The other thing is there could be a pre-sentence investigation after uh, a guilty verdict, and anytime there's a sentence, if there is probation, the probation department would monitor that individual. There would be check-ins, there could be drug screens, they might have to uh, keep a job, things like that. I will not intrude on their territory, but at this end of the process, big involvement of the probation department, they also do bond investigations. We'll leave that for another day. This is a very detailed process. If I were drawing the graph or drawing the chart just to indicate all the rights that are involved, the box here for trial would be bigger than the screen. Getting back to the Magna Carta, getting back to our Constitution, there are many, many constitutional rights that are very strictly enforced. Right to a fair and impartial jury, right to effective assistance of counsel, right to confront witnesses, right to remain silent and not have to testify against yourself. 
freedom to be uh, not subject to cruel and unusual punishment, right to speedy trial. All those things, we could spend a whole seminar on all the rights that are protected here. If you think that we are perhaps as a society too cautious about people's rights, remember that not guilty, innocent people can be caught up in this criminal proceeding. Uh, let me say two words that will persuade you that mistakes do happen. Duke lacrosse. People do jump to conclusions as to guilt or innocence. There can be wide publicity. People can get all convinced that something bad happened and eventually somebody is totally exonerated. Mistakes happen and there are safeguards in the proceeding to make sure that those mistakes are caught and corrected. Think Duke lacrosse. Again, the clerk's office handles all the paper, everything that is filed from the indictment down to the verdict and the notice of appeal, all goes through the clerk's office. Where does the common police court sit in the grand scheme of things, this pyramid-shaped justice system that we've got? Any decision from our court, common police court general division, or for that matter, any other part of the common police court can be appealed to the 12th district. Judge Ringland and his uh, compatriots would hear the case. Municipal court cases can also be ap appealed to the 12th district. If someone is unsatisfied there, they can go to the Ohio Supreme Court. Potentially, they can go to the, Ohio, to the United States Supreme Court from the Ohio Supreme Court. I don't know of any Claremont County case that did that. Perhaps some other of you that know local history better than I would know whether uh, any court case has gone this path. On the federal side, this is the federal court. This is the trial court. They would appeal to the Sixth Circuit, which is also based in Cincinnati and then it could go to the uh, United States Supreme Court. One of the uh, marriage equality cases did start in Cincinnati, the Obergefell case, made its way up through this chain and led to the decision a couple years ago. So it's possible for local matters, even if it's in our court, to eventually become the law of the land. It's part of a very detailed system that protects the rights of many, many people. These are rough approximations. We took some numbers in the middle of the year, just doubled them. These numbers may have changed significantly, but you can see we still have a large number of foreclosure cases, even though that's about half of what it was during the foreclosure crisis. You think that uh, personal injury cases are important. We actually have more, let's call them contract cases, than we have injury cases. Civil protection orders, lots of those. There are people that are doing things to their neighbors, to their friends, to their family, ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, whatever it might be, they really shouldn't be doing. I like to think of civil protection orders as preventive law. We try to do some things that make sure that uh, circumstances don't get out of hand, that people are not harmed or injured, that everybody lives in peace. So we have a lot of civil protection orders. Criminal dockets about this size, there's the total divided amongst our four judges. So we've got a lot of cases, wide range of both criminal and civil matters, all handled in the general division of the court. Jury duty, who's been summoned for jury duty? Yeah, we're seeing some hands. Two different types, and you have to read your paperwork carefully. There's the grand jury, which is that screen, that filter that makes sure that only supposedly guilty, probable cause-based guilty parties, people that there's some very strong suspicion they committed a crime. They're indicted and start into the criminal system. Pettit jury can be either criminal or civil. Those are the ones that make the decision, guilty, not guilty, defendant owes a million dollars, whatever those decisions might be, whether it's a contract case or an arson case, whatever it could be. Those are the ones that are a little more, a lot more prevalent because the grand jury is so small. Only one grand jury sits at any one particular time. We have reports Tuesday and Thursday. We could theoretically have four courtrooms with criminal and civil cases going during any one particular week. So again, going back to the Magna Carta, trial by jury of your peers, constitutional right, and it's important in both the criminal and the civil arena. Judge and magistrate, you've heard me use the terms, they are not interchangeable. Judge has the full authority of the court. Judge can send somebody to death row, 
can impose a $100 fine, can decide that somebody owes $1,000 on a contract. Full authority of the court can sign final orders, can sign orders that can go to the Court of Appeals. As a magistrate, I'm an attorney, but I don't have the full authority of a judge. I can hear certain cases, I can make orders in civil protection, order cases, I can do uh, some preliminary work on motions practice or discovery. If the parties agree, a case can go to me for trial, but my decision is not final, the judge would have a chance to review it. So we work in tandem, we work as uh, a part of a team, judges, and below them the magistrates, to move the cases through on the civil side of the docket. Civil protection order comes in two flavors. There's the quick, immediate, let's get something in place right away, because there's an immediate threat. Those are heard within 24 hours of filing. The clerk's office processes them very quickly, come up to the magistrate's office, they're signed. Magistrates hear them, one of the judges hears his own. Get those and make sure that there is something in place right away. The real guts of it are no contact, stay away. Usually 500 feet, sometimes it's different. Had a stay away order one time, family members, they all wanted to go see the kids play peewee football, but they would hassle with each other and cause public scenes. Anyone want to take a wild guess why I set a 160 foot stay away order? 160 feet is the width of a football field. I basically put them on opposite sidelines so they could all go watch the kids play but they couldn't interact with each other. You gotta be a sports nut to know it's 160 feet. Everyone knows 300, 300 feet, 100 yards, but you gotta be a sports nut to know it's 160 feet. We try to custom tailor these orders to make sure <clears throat> that prevention is the order of the day, that people are not being hassled, they're not being bothered. On a full hearing, which usually uh, occurs within two weeks of the filing, you can need to an order that's up to five years. And those same sort of stay away, same sort of no contact provisions. I make a joke that any, any um, civil protection order case we ought to name Facebook as a co-respondent. <laughs> a lot of people get into just colossal hassles on Facebook. And we just say, block them. Don't have any contact. Stop using Facebook. Because people will start to bother and harass each other and they use electronic media to do it and it just becomes a problem. So this is a recent development within say the last 20 years and we try very hard to use it wisely to make sure that there's peace in Claremont County. Probation, we've already touched on that, it's called community control. The idea being instead of just tossing somebody to sell and letting them come out three or five or eight years later and they're basically the same person get them into a drug treatment program, get them into an alcohol treatment program, give them some new job skills, anger management, make sure that they're maybe living with uh, a different set of people, different circle of friends, try to straighten out their lives. So probation tries very specifically to rehabilitate and change people's behavior, and it plays a major role in how we handle our criminal docket. I'll leave uh, the experts to make that presentation at a later date. This is a real hot button issue. Everybody seems to think, oh God, you know, cases take too long. Take a look at the flowcharts I passed out. These aren't decisions, these aren't processes that can be run in a day or a week or even a month. To be fair to everyone, the process, either on the criminal side or the civil side, has to take its time. Justice cannot be rushed. A hasty decision can be just as much and injustice as a delayed decision. So we try where possible to make sure that injured parties in personal injury cases, you know, they've had multiple surgeries, they've done their physical therapy, make sure that they are completely healed. Sometimes there has to be discovery. What do the experts say? Can the experts figure out why something happened? Uh, you know, can an expert uh, project how much income someone's going to lose if say they're an amputee and they can't go back to their old job. A lot of detailed work, a lot of important work that goes on behind the scenes that may necessitate a significant period of time between the filing of a case and the conclusion of a case. Due process can't be rushed. 
getting back to those basic principles that everyone is treated fairly, justice is a local matter, that we try to make sure the court system works as well as it can. You don't rush the process. You do it, try to get it right. Try to get it right the first time. Do judges make law? Sometimes you get those sound bites, thank heaven the political ads are over for another couple of years. Do judges make law? Well, let's talk about that a bit. It's not a simple answer. It can't be compressed into a political slogan. As judges and magistrates, we follow the law as set out in the Ohio Revised Code and in the case law that's been handed down by the Ohio Supreme Court. And sometimes we look at federal law, especially for constitutional rights or where federal statutes like anti-discrimination laws <clears throat> have state application. So we try, wherever possible, to follow the rules that are either made by the General Assembly or made by a higher court. But what happens if you get new facts, new circumstances? Drones. Drones have come up in the last five or six years. Can you trespass if I fly my drone over your property? No common law court in England ever considered that. But a court in Ohio may have to address that point because technology has changed and we need a modification of certain rules to make sure that we're keeping up with the times. You have privacy rights. You have property rights above the land that you own. I may not be able to intrude on that, but it's basic principles, old principles, being applied to new circumstances. Twitter, Twitter is, what, five or six years old? If I say bad things about you as a public official on Twitter, that would never happen. Of course not. I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> if I were to defame you, it would be on Facebook, which is where I, where I conduct most of my getting in touch with my high school friends, my college friends, and family. If I were to defame you on Facebook, we would be applying principles from the quill pen era. Someone's reputation is important. Someone's re reputation should not be damaged with false accusations. And someone would have a right to recover if their reputation were damaged. That all was established in the quill pen era, the old printing press that you did with a hand crank. Now somebody sits at a keyboard, you can damage somebody else's reputation. So our judges have to adapt older legal principles to newer circumstances and newer situations. The law evolves, the law changes with time as society changes, <coughs> as technology changes, as expectations change. As good as the common law of England was as to property, contract, and torts, it's pretty lousy as to women. Women were property. Women couldn't own property. Women couldn't inherit. All kinds of really onerous things applied to women centuries ago. But we have evolved as a society, and now we've got equality. Maybe not perfect equality, but the court system continues to work on these issues and get to the point where things are as good as they can get, then a new technology or a new circumstance will come up and the courts will continue to apply those principles and try to move things forward. Any ruling the court makes, say one of our judges says, yes, there can be a trespass if a drone flies over someone's property. A court in another county in Ohio follows that. Maybe it gets to the Ohio Supreme Court. Ohio Supreme Court says, yeah, it's a violation, it's a trespass, and the drone flies over. That could become the law of the state. Did we make law? Well, it's a new application of an old principle, but the judges, through this process, with the aid of the attorneys making the arguments for and against, have created a principle that's updated, if you will. You're, you're trying to tell me something, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. All right, I can take a hint. Let, let's run through here a little bit. Mediation is an alternative to going to trough. We sit down in a discussion process. I'm the mediator for the Common Police Court General Division. We try to settle things through rational discussion. It's free. It's a service the court provides. It's very effective and certainly may work in circumstances that affect government agencies. Uh, we had for a while um, 
tax foreclosure mediation, and we've got to switch things around a little bit, but mediation can be a very powerful way to make sure that both sides' rights are protected and both sides come out a winner through minimizing risk and things like that. Again, that's our building. It's public. You have an afternoon free, come on down and watch a trial. Come see what goes on in front of a judge. Most of our dockets are set at 8.30, 9 o'clock, mid-morning sometimes. Come see what goes on. Ohio has public courtrooms. You can come in, it's a real civics lesson. If you get a jury summons, don't evade it. Come be part of the process. Come be a citizen input into the machinery of justice. Can't see the red there, but we do have a website. It's in the process of being updated. ClaremontCommonPleas.com, and certainly the Ohio Supreme Court has a very detailed and very good website uh, that uh, sets out the law, sets out the legal system and many of the legal principles in Ohio. Um, don't go to court based on anything that I've said today. It, it, it's too simplistic, and your rights are too important to be trusted just to a little 45 minute seminar with me. Get the advice of counsel should you need it. This is what it's going to look like. This is our old website. You may have seen this. Your agencies may have had websites like that. That's the standard template. We're now moving to this. We would hope within a couple weeks to have a, uh, a good rollout of this new site, which would be, we hope, much more user friendly, much more helpful to everyone. Questions? Sir? You had a slide about mediation. Can you explain how that might be different than arbitration? <laughs> Very much so. Arbitration is closer to what judges do. A neutral makes a decision. This side wins, this side loses. Maybe you've got a construction case and there's some dispute about how the building was built. You can get an engineer to be an arbitrator. You can get an architect to be an arbitrator. You can get a general contractor to be an arbitrator. It doesn't have to be a lawyer. But they would hear from both sides and say, okay, it's the structural steel installer that's at fault. Somebody makes a decision. Sometimes it's a panel of three, uh, three arbitrators, and they make a decision. Mediation is diplomacy. The neutral doesn't make a decision. Would you be willing to accept 20000 to get your case settled? Would the insurance company be willing to pay 20000 to get the case settled? It's up to the parties to make the decision. The mediator just helps guide them through the process. Instead of talking about football or the playoffs or something like that, let's focus on the case. Now, what were those injuries again? How long was the injured party in the hospital? Things like that. The mediator is a discussion leader, a catalyst, a go-between. There's sometimes shuttle diplomacy. I think I could sell the other side on um, giving you a half an acre of the disputed land and uh, pay 20000 towards your legal fees. Would that be something to be okay? All right. I think they'd be willing to transfer some land. Do you think a, a half an acre might satisfy you? That, would that be okay? And there's going to have to be a cash component, too. There'll be dismissals with prejudice. Everybody will file deeds with the reporter's office to make sure so that this uh, land dispute doesn't pop up again. Would that be okay with you? See, uh, they've agreed. Now, we're going to have to draft some documents, but would you be okay with the land transfer as well as money and then file documents with the recorder's office? This mediation go back and forth, back and forth between the parties. Sometimes you do it with everybody in the same room. Sometimes you split them up. I had one yesterday that was kind of a love triangle. I didn't let the parties in the same room at all. Yeah, one, <laughs> one in the law library with counsel, one in my conference room with counsel. I kept my comfortable shoes on. I went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But you do that because that's what a mediator does. A peacemaker. An arbitrator is a decision maker. Other questions? Sir? Who or what determines the number of judges in the county that there's your county to county? Good question. Um, the General Assembly sets the number of judges. It changes with population changes. Um, sometimes they can be kind of hot potatoes. Well, you know, we'll give you a judge in Erie County if you let us have a new judge in Seneca County. Things like that. Every once in a while, and certainly Ohio has had declining population, um, the number of judges will decrease. They will eliminate a judgeship. Or in some of the suburbs, they will consolidate small 
municipal courts into one bigger municipal court that would cover a uh, broader jurisdiction. It's all set by the General Assembly. The Supreme Court has input based on caseload, demographics, population shifts, things like that. Um, I actually live in Delaware County, and the judges there did double duty as both common pleas general and domestic. And eventually, because the population is just booming in Delaware County, they created a new domestic relations court judgeship, and that judge will get all the domestic cases, and then the two sitting general division judges will be just general division cases, criminal and civil only. So sometimes, um, in addition to creating judgeships, they will create separate divisions within a particular county. Okay, other questions? Sarah, I just want to ask you sure. a second. When Please. You were showing the pictures of the old courthouse and the new courthouse. On the old courthouse, uh, where the doors were, mm -hmm. went in, where that window is now, that's our bicentennial, our, our 100, 200th anniversary of the county. It yep. was about seven of us through the Convention and Business Bureau, Connie and myself, uh, that designed that, basically, and formed that wall there. Mm -hmm. I, and the reason I'm only saying that, because if I'm outside for some reason, People are reading on the sides there, and they ask me, how how that happen? Mm -hmm. And that's how it happened. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah, yeah, it, it's absolutely lovely. I've taken pictures of it. It's a, a nice shot if you can get up, get close. Each of the, was it 12 townships, uh, 12 or 13, whatever it is, has a 13, yeah. you know, a covered bridge. Promont is in there. The old courthouse is in there for Batavia. Uh, it's well worth looking at. It is a beautiful stained glass representation of the history of our community. Other questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate your attention.